Greetings, Spooky fans! Michael here, and normal type moves are the only type of attack in Pokemon that cannot deal super effective damage to anything. They do neutral damage to everything except rock and steel which resist it, and ghost which is immune to it. That makes it one of, if not the, most limited attacking types in the game. But I thought it would be fun to see just how limited this attacking type is. Today, I'm embarking on my newest Pokemon playthrough challenge, Can I Beat Pokemon Fire Red While Only Using Normal Type Moves? Well, the answer to that question depends on your definition of use. If it means use at all, then no, you can't. Using Surf outside of battle is required to beat the game, and Surf is obviously water type. However, if you define use as use in battle, then I think I might have a chance might being the operative word here. The rules, or should I say rule of this challenge is simple. I can only use normal type moves in every battle sequence in the entire game. And the term moves applies to both attacks and status moves. So I can use growl since it's normal type, but I can't use withdraw because it's water type. The Pokemon I use can be whatever type I want and can know any move they want, I just can't select any non-normal type moves in battle. If I do, whether by accident or because I just ran out of all of my normal type moves, then I have to reset my game to the last save point. So that covers all the intro stuff, so don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Subscribe. I'm making an emphasis on this because it's important. And let's dive in to Can I Beat Pokemon Fire Red? while only using normal type moves. To start off the game, I named myself Michael and my rival an abbreviation of Pokemon 7 after my most vile enemy. I'm kidding, we're very good friends and we make lots of videos together on my second channel, so you should subscribe to him and also my second channel. Step one was choosing my starter, and I went with Squirtle, because its status move was Tail Whip, something appealing since that meant I could make its tackles do more. I named it Turtle because Squirtle is a turtle that squirts water. This one will not be squirting any water, so therefore, it is just a turtle. Suddenly, Pokemon 7 attacked. After a Tail Whip, my regular turtle dealt with his Bulbasaur after just a few turns of tackling. A little while later, after running Oak's errands for him, I encountered and caught a Rattata I named Vermin. I knew that normal type Pokemon, a type of Pokemon I have overlooked a lot in the past, were going to be instrumental for the success of this playthrough. While they learn normal type moves like lots of other types of Pokemon, the normal type Pokemon get a 50% boost to the power of their normal type moves thanks to Stab, the same type attack boost. Rattata is a particularly appealing early game normal type since it gets the eye-popping 80 base power Hyper Fang at the fantastically low level of just 13. I think that's the first time in my life I've ever referred to Rattata as appealing. After grinding Vermin up, I made my way through Viridian Forest without too many problems. Unfortunately though, I had an exceedingly difficult trial in front of me, Brock. Brock is a rock type gym leader and rock type Pokemon are a nightmare to fight if you can only use normal type moves. First off, they resist normal, but also they tend to have high physical defense, which is an issue since all normal type attacks are physical attacks in generation three. As evil icing on the cake, a lot of these rock types also know Defense Curl or Harden, which makes them even tougher to KO with physical moves. I knew I would need some kind of strategy beyond just brute forcing my way through because I didn't want to spend ages grinding and super overleveling my Pokemon. My first thought was that I could poison his Pokemon. That way they would take damage over time even if I myself wasn't doing much damage. Unfortunately, Poison Sting and Poison Powder are against the rules, but Poison Point is not. There's no rule against what abilities my Pokemon can have, and Poison Point is an ability that can poison the enemy Pokemon if they make contact. The most easily accessible Pokemon with Poison Point are the Nidorans, which are found on Route 3 just east of Pewter City, which this douche canoe won't let me go to. Ugh, okay, new plan. I can't poison them and I can't burn them. There's no flame body Pokemon I can find, but I can do the third best thing, which is paralyzing them. 
while that doesn't do damage to them, it makes them slower and will give me more chances to hit them without them hitting me. And I can do the paralysis by using the ability Static. I got the ability on a Pikachu that I found in Viridian Forest relatively easily and named it Parahax. I then decided to try out my strategy idea on the first and only gym trainer, who told me I was 10,000 light years from facing Brock. Little prick thinks 10,000 light years is time when it's distance. <laughs> Uh, and he was, he was still kind of right. I led against his Geodude with Vermin to test my damage output. It did that little before it had gotten any defense boosts, so that was not great. I immediately switched to Parahax to implement my next strategy, killing its attack with Growl while I hoped it would get paralyzed. Unfortunately, it KO'd Parahax before Static kicked in. After a very long battle, it looked like Vermin was going to win, but then Geodude got a crit. Turtle came in and finished off the Geodude, but it couldn't beat the Sand Shrew due to its defense curl and sand attack, plus Scratch doing a lot since I hadn't growled it at all. I gave up part of the way through as to not lose my limited potions. This battle taught me that Parahax had to be a higher level. I tried it without leveling it up at all, and that wasn't gonna work. It needed to be able to take more hits so there were more opportunities for static to activate, but also so it could stay in long enough to get more growls off. That sand true caused problems because its scratches did so much damage and Onyx's rock tombs would be even worse. Unfortunately, Parahax did not know a normal type attack, which meant that I had to switch train it to grind it up, which was very slow and very annoying. After just a bit of grinding and vermin learning Hyper Fang, I decided to try to beat the gym trainer again because I had grown impatient. This time, after it maxed its defense and I minimized its attack, I got the paralysis on the Geodude. I then brought in Vermin, who after many turns and a potion due to a crit, was able to take the Geodude down. In came Sand True and I did the same thing again. Growl until I got it to minus six attack while I waited for Static to kick in. This took a long time due to Sand Attack making me miss a lot of growls, but eventually Static worked and I even got to cancel out one of its defense curls before it took Parahax down. I had to do some switching between Turtle and Vermin to get rid of accuracy drops, but eventually I was able to defeat the Gym Trainer. I had proved that my Growl and Paralysis strategy could work, so I just now had to level up my team even more to fight the higher level Brock. So after even more grinding, I took him on. The battle started badly, as his Geodude crit Parahax right away but then it turned around because I got the static paralysis the next time it attacked. A few turns later, I decided to switch in Vermin, since while I hadn't minimized the Geodude's attack, it hadn't boosted its defense all the way yet, so I thought I would get in damage while I could. This was the right call, as the drops I had done made it so Vermin only took four HP damage from each tackle. I began wearing down its health with quick attacks to preserve Hyper Fangs for Onyx, and I even got a crit at one point. After a while, I took the Geodude down. In came Onyx, and I brought Parahax back in. I healed it up right away, which was the right call since Rock Tomb did a lot. Then the next time Onyx tackled, I luckily got the static activation right away. After several more turns, one of them using a potion and a few of them with full paralysis on Onyx, I was able to get Onyx to minus six attack and minus one defense, since it didn't use Harden once. Finally, it took Parahax down. Then I brought in Vermin, whose first Hyper Fang crit and did half. Onyx was fully paralyzed. Then I Hyper Fanged again, and it was paralyzed again. My final Hyper Fang crit a second time, KOing the Onyx and winning me the Brock battle on the first try and actually making me yell in excitement. I beat a giant rock snake with two small rodents. Once on Route 3, I caught a Nidoran male in order to be able to use the Poison Point strategy I wanted to use earlier on future rock types. I randomly named it Needle. Unfortunately, soon after, I realized that Nidoran male did not learn a normal type attack until level 20 if I kept it from evolving, or level 22 if I let it become a Nidorino. However, Nidoran female had scratched right away. I wanted one of them to be useful right away for the rock types I knew I'd fight in Mount Moon, so I caught a Nidoran female and named it Empress, then trained it up to evolve and be about equal levels with Vermin. 
The journey through Mount Moon was smooth, aside from a battle with a Magnemite, which proved tricky due to it resisting my moves, dropping harshly my special defense with metal sound, and jolting me with thundershocks. Eventually I beat it with Parahax, since static actually works on electric types in this generation. Upon exiting Mount Moon, I had the opportunity to teach one of my Pokemon Mega Kick and Mega Punch, but for the time being, I decided to keep those options open for later, since they're just one-time tutors. In Cerulean, Pokemon 7 attacked once again. Vermin had to take some hits from Pidgeotto, but was able to handle it. Empress dealt with Rattata, but also took some hits in the process. Abra couldn't do anything, so Empress was able to beat it without taking a hit. Finally was Bulbasaur, and this thing, new Sleep Powder. As soon as I saw that move happen, I instantly regretted my starter decision. I wasn't even using Turtle anymore. And now for the rest of the game, I had to contend with my rival's best Pokemon being able to put all my Pokemon to sleep with relative ease. Ugh. The Bulbasaur battle started very badly. Despite healing, Vermin was asleep and down to red HP in a matter of a few turns without even being able to get a hit off. I brought in Empress who resisted the Vine Whips. It wasn't long though before she was asleep too. Then to make things worse, Bulbasaur leech seeded, meaning any damage I did with Scratch was gone after just two turns. I realized my only way to win was to drop its defenses, so during a brief waking moment, I tail whipped. Empress then fell to leech seed. I brought in Parahax to get more tail whips off, and thanks to Sleep Powder missing twice, I got it down to minus four defense before Parahax took a nap. I used my chance to heal Vermin in the two turns it took Parahax to fall. Vermin came back in, but was still asleep. After sleeping for two turns, it landed a Hyper Fang, Okoing the Bulbasaur. This victory caused it to level up and evolve into Raticate. The next time I play through a Kanto game, there is no way in booty butts that I am picking Squirtle again. I love Squirtle, but sleep powder on this Bulbasaur is so annoying. But now that that nightmare was over, for the time being, I decided it was time to train up Needle the Nidoran male. Now, of course, it doesn't know a normal type move, but if I could keep it from evolving into level 20, it would learn Horn Attack. Then, if I used a Moonstone on it right away, which I could do, I got a couple from Mount Moon, it would become Nido King, which learns Thrash at level 22, which is the strongest move in the game by a, well, only about 10 base power points over Hyper Fang, but still, that was, it was exciting. After a long time switch training it against both trainers and wild Pokemon, Nita learned Horn Attack at level 20, so I allowed it to evolve into Nidorino. I then immediately evolved it into Nido King, then trained it up two more levels so it could learn Thrash. And then of course, it took me all of this time before I realized that it had an attack lowering nature. But it's fine, I'd committed and I was sticking with it. Feeling confident, I challenged Misty. Needle immediately O-coded Staryu with Thrash, which was beautiful. In came Starmie, who unfortunately outsped and landed a super effective Water Pulse. I was able to get a Thrash hit in, but it only did about a third. Starmie's next Water Pulse, of course, KO'd. I brought in Vermin, who tanked a Water Pulse and did big damage with Hyper Fang, but didn't KO. I went for Quick Attack, but she healed up. She Water Pulsed again, but Vermin held on. I healed, she Water Pulsed, but this time it confused me. I was worried if Vermin hurt itself, I would lose, but I clicked Quick Attack anyways. It fought through the Rubber Duck Haze, landed Quick Attack, and won me the battle. Two gyms down. After training Needle and Vermin up against various trainers around Vermilion and on the SSN, and avoiding all the workers because fighting Magnemites really sucks. The next event of note was Pokemon 7 attacking again, this time on a boat. Since I'd only been training Needle and Vermin, they were much higher level than my rival's team, which made the battle much easier to manage. All his Pokemon went down easily except Ivysaur, who of course decided to sleep powder again, that stupid flowering frog. It nearly KO'd Needle, but once I woke up, I won the battle. After a traumatic experience in the captain's room, it was time to challenge Lieutenant Surge. Another battle Needle and Vermin were very overleveled for. Needle took down Voltorb and Pikachu without taking a hit. Raichu proved more annoying due to double team and ridiculous thrash confusion hacks. Needle hit itself in confusion four consecutive times, but after a combination of him healing, even using a full heal for the poison at one point, me healing, poison damage, and finally landing a thrash, I won the battle without any Pokemon fainting. 
Next was Rock Tunnel, which proved bothersome at times to do all the rock type Pokemon I had to fight, even avoiding all the hikers that I could. But Vermin and Needle got me through. I spent very little time in Lavender Town and immediately headed west to catch a Growlithe. As we've already seen, rock and steel type Pokemon are very difficult to deal with, but ghost type Pokemon are impossible to deal with in this playthrough because my normal type moves cannot hurt them at all. There might have been a way for me to beat them using some strategy with like making themselves KO themselves with curse or confusion or something like that, but those depended too much on luck and just sounded not very fun. Before I went into the Pokemon Tower, I wanted a reliable way to defeat ghost types, and that reliable way was Odor Sleuth. Odor Sleuth is a normal type move that not only makes it so the target's evasion boosts are ignored, but it also makes ghost types lose their immunities to fighting and normal moves. Growlithe is the only Pokemon in the game that can learn it, and it's the reason I picked Fire Red over Leaf Green, since it's a Fire Red exclusive. For the record, Foresight is another move that accomplishes the same thing. So you can still do this in Leaf Green, you just have to go for Machop or Hitmonlee and teach them Foresight. However, I really wanted to use Arcanine because Arcanine is cool and also learns extreme speed later in the game, which I thought might come in handy. I caught the Growlithe and due to its purpose being to be sniffing around to find things, I nicknamed it Bloodhound. Also, it had a jolly nature, which was incredible for an Arcanine not using any special attacks. Unfortunately, it didn't have a normal type attack and wouldn't get one until level 25 being takedown. But then after a bit of switch training, I realized I could get the secret power TM at the department store in Celadon a normal type move with varying secondary effects depending on the location the battle is occurring. I taught it to Bloodhound and used it as its main attack. Next was the Rocket Hideout. Getting through here required quite a few backtracks to heal up since Bloodhound wasn't strong enough to Oko much of anything. Eventually though, I made it to Giovanni. Through a combination of poison damage and simply hitting it over and over again, Needle defeated Onyx. Needle got one hit off on Rhyhorn before being confused, and after the surge battle, I was getting rid of that confusion ASAP. I brought in Bloodhound to drop its attack with Intimidate and its defense with several Leers. I brought Needle back in, who was now able to do much more damage, taking down Rhyhorn in two more hits. I brought in Bloodhound briefly due to Needle's confusion, then brought Needle back in. Thrash did a lot less to Kangaskhan than I was expecting, but Needle broke through confusion to get the final hit needed to win. And then after this battle, I realized that Bloodhound no longer needed to be a Growlithe. It had learned Takedown at level 25, and then the only other normal type move it learned by level up was Helping Hand, a move which is obviously useless in a game with very few double battles. Then Arcanine was the one who learned Extreme Speed, not Growlithe. Essentially, I had no incentive to keep it from evolving, so that's fun. All I had to do was buy a Firestone from the department store and evolve Bloodhound into an Arcanine. With the Sylph scope in hand, I headed into the Pokemon Tower. The rival battle proved annoying once again, due to sleep powder. I super regret picking Squirtle, but Bloodhound was able to deal with it. Thanks to Bloodhound's odor sleuthing and secret power power, I took down every ghost that got in my way in the tower. After clearing it out, Mr. Fuji gifted me the Poke Flute, and you know what that means. It's Snorlax time. In a playthrough where I can only use normal type moves, I would be a buffoon to not use Snorlax. I decided I would go catch both of them and then use whichever one was stronger. Catching Snorlax is never fun since it can heal itself, but I successfully caught the first one and named it Lockdown, then caught the second one and named it Quarantine. I named them Lockdown and Quarantine because during Lockdown slash Quarantine, I think we've all become a bit more like Snorlax. Comparing the two, Lockdown was better in basically every way, with a better nature and seemingly better IVs, so it was the one I went with. Then I took on Erica, and it was a piece of cake. Her victory bell poisoned Vermin, meaning she fell into my trap. Vermin has guts, so its attacks got way stronger, and in a matter of just a few more turns, Vermin had swept through her team, giving me my easiest gym battle so far. I then made my way to Fuchsia City because I wanted to get to the Safari Zone ASAP. On my first trip though, I did the necessary story stuff of getting the gold teeth and surf, then headed to look for a Kangaskhan. I wanted a Kangaskhan because it can have the ability Scrappy, 
an ability that lets it hit ghost type Pokemon with normal and fighting type moves just all the time. I wanted this because it would be a second and I think more reliable way for me to attack ghost type Pokemon than having to use Odor Sleuth on Arcanine. But then after about five minutes of looking for a Kangaskhan, I thought to myself, is Scrappy an ability that's in Gen 3? No, it is not. Well, glad I realized that before I spent too much time on it. Instead of Kangaskhan, I considered Tauros because I love Tauros, but it was pretty rare and also would be difficult to catch. Instead, I decided I wanted a Dodrio because it's fast and reasonably strong, plus it gets the really cool move Tri-Attack, which is physical in this gen and would allow me to get some useful status conditions on enemies that I wouldn't have access to otherwise. Also, it could be my flyer no matter how illogical that is. On my second trip into the Safari Zone, I caught a Doduo and named it Bird Brains because I'm very funny. For the rest of that trip, I decided to screw around and actually found a Tauros and actually caught it, naming it Longhorn. An added bit of craziness is that I found this Tauros with only five steps left in this Safari trip. Clearly it was meant to be, so welcome to the squad, Longhorn, holy crap. I now had what I intended to be my final team of six, and now a lot of them knew strength because I had that HM now, and it's a solid normal type move. It was then time to grind against all of the trainers because my team was way too weak to fight Koga. I spent a very long time clearing out all of the trainers between Celadon and Fuchsia and Lavender and Fuchsia, which is, I've always thought was weird in the Kanto games. Like, oh, here's this one item, the Poke Flute. Now here's half the map. Once I did that, I continued my trainer grinding in Sylphco, eventually reaching my next duel with Pokemon 7 in an oddly corporate setting. Overall, this battle went very smoothly with me taking out all but one of his Pokemon without any of mine getting below green HP. That final Pokemon was the cursed Sleep Powder Happy Venusaur though, so right away I had Lockdown give it a taste of its own medicine by using Yawn. And then it immediately Sleep Powdered me back. But this time it didn't matter since Lockdown had Snore, allowing it to still attack despite being asleep. And then it woke up immediately, so the second Snore failed. But that was fine, since Venusaur was now asleep and I could body slam it into oblivion. That was by far the easiest battle I had had with Pokemon 7 since the Bulbasaur or Ivysaur Venusaur learned Sleep Powder. I guess it pays to have a member of your team that is a sleep specialist. Soon it was time to battle Giovanni again. I had Vermin up against Nidorino for a chance at Poison Point, giving it the Guts Boost, but it didn't happen and Vermin just beat it in two turns. Then came Nidoqueen and Vermin did get poisoned, but double kick and poison damage took it out soon after. I brought in Needle for a fun monarch face off and thanks to Thrash critting and me resisting the double kicks, Needle won in three turns. In came Kangaskhan and Longhorn beat it with four strengths and it would have been three with a better damage roll. Finally was another cursed rock type, Rhyhorn. I brought in Needle for a chance at poison pointing it, and I got my wish early on. I then brought in Lockdown since it was my hardest hitter, and a few body slams later, Rhyhorn was down and I had won. The rich old guy gave me the Master Ball, which I had no intention of using aside from maybe a wild shiny. Then I headed straight to Koga's gym. I led with Vermin for a chance at guts poisoning, but it took out the first coughing before that happened. In came Muck, who promptly minimized, so I started to drop its defense with Leer, so I needed to hit it fewer times to KO it. Vermin survived an attack, then landed a strength, which got the KO. Vermin needed a rest, so I brought in Longhorn for the next coughing. Longhorn got toxic poisoned in the process, but was still able to beat the coughing easily. Finally was his level 43 Weezing, which I used Lockdown for. After a yawn, I started body slamming away while Koga healed with a full heal, then Hyper Potion. I just kept body slamming, and it was enough to overwhelm him and get the win. I headed straight to Sabrina's gym without delay. You know, aside from healing and beating all of her gym trainers. Sabrina is typically the toughest gym leader, but her team doesn't handle strong physical attackers well. Longhorn obliterated her first two Pokemon. Then her Venomoth stuck around a while due to her healing efforts, but Lockdown beat it easily. Finally was Alakazam, which Lockdown outsped with Quick Claw, but couldn't quite Oko it, allowing it to use Calm Mind, which was terrifying. 
Thankfully, Lockdown's beefiness let it tank the next boosted Psychic, then finish off the battle the next turn. Six badges down. On the way to Cinnabar, Vermin reached level 40 and was finally able to learn Super Fang. Learning Super Fang was a big deal, and it was one of the two main reasons I had kept Vermin on my team all this time, despite it being weaker than my other normal types. The first reason is that I had grown attached. Come on, the thing beat Brock's Onyx. Like, it's awesome. Super Fang is a move that halves the target's current HP, and Raticate is the only Pokemon to get it in this generation. This is amazing because it allows me to do big damage onto rock type Pokemon without having to worry about their high defense or resistances. Next was my jumped through the Pokemon Mansion. And side note here, I wish my first time exploring through the Pokemon Mansion had been before I knew what Mewtwo was. The diaries lying around in the decrepit lab are really cool examples of environmental storytelling but it's not as impactful if you already know the story, which I did when I went through the Pokemon Mansion, cause I'd seen the first movie. I knew what Mewtwo was. After clearing out the trainers on the water routes and getting to see Blaine's classic line, it was time to take him down. I led with Bloodhound to resist incoming fire moves. It was once again up against its pre-evolution, but despite Blaine's Growlithe being higher level, my dog was the one to win out. Next was Ponyta, who I brought in Lockdown for due to its thick fat. Bounce unfortunately paralyzed, but Lockdown hit through and O-code Ponyta. Lockdown attacked through Paralysis again to defeat Rapidash. Finally was the level 47 Arcanine, and Paralysis finally started to cause problems, keeping me from moving two turns in a row. I answered with my own Paralysis from Body Slam, which he promptly full healed away, then healed back up once I'd worn it down. Lockdown kept at it until Arcanine took it down. I brought in Longhorn who got in a hit, amazingly survived a fire blast, then ended it, winning me the battle. After leaving the gym, Bill suddenly arrived wanting to take me to the Sevi Islands. It has been so long since I played Fire Red or Leaf Green, I think genuinely over 10 years, that I totally forgot that you went to the Sevi Islands before battling the Pokemon League. I remembered the whole plot line of it once it started, but I was genuinely surprised when Bill showed up like, hey, let's go. I did a like a confused double take. Long story short, I witnessed the Council of Compsi Majors, got repeatedly punched in the face, bathed with old men, met the father of a girl with a situationally appropriate name, made an unwise decision to fight an entire biker gang, but won anyways, and rescued the lost Lost L. Back on the mainland, it was time for the Viridian Gym, the most grueling set of gym trainers I've battled in a long time. That place is chock full of ace trainers with teams of five Pokemon and potions. So that's annoying on its own, but normally it wouldn't be too bad, except most of the Pokemon in that gym are rock or fighting types, which are two types of Pokemon that my mostly normal team does not appreciate. After a lot of long battles and many trips back outside to heal, I finally cleared them all and was ready to fight Giovanni, which I was expecting to be the toughest gym battle since the first one. He led with Rhyhorn, and I immediately began implementing my strategy for how to defeat it. Massively drop its attack by swapping between my two Intimidate Pokemon to make it so Vermin could live hits. Then bring in Vermin to Super Fang. This worked great since all it wanted to do was Scary Face for the first chunk of time. It still took a while to take it down once Vermin came in due to him healing, then me having to heal, but eventually Vermin got the KO. In came Nido Queen, and I brought in Bird Brains both because it was immune to ground and because Tri-Attack did not make contact, thus making Poison Point useless. Tri-Attack froze it, allowing me to hit it again. It barely didn't KO though, so for the final hit, I clicked Fury Attack to save Tri-Attack PP. It got the KO, but Poison Point poisoned Bird Brains. In came the second, much higher level than me, Rhyhorn, and I began my Intimidate swapping strategy until it was at minus six attack. Once Vermin came in, I super fanged twice, then tail whipped it twice, because I knew Strength couldn't KO it at quarter health. Unfortunately, it landed a crit earthquake, which KO'd Vermin. However, the defense and health drops it was able to pull off allowed Longhorn to come in and easily finish it off. 
Bird Brains then defeated Nido King and Doug Trio relatively easily, winning me my final badge. Next was the final attack of Pokemon 7 before the league. Pidgeot proved annoying due to Feather Dance dropping my attack, but I was able to get things done. Then he brought in his Rhyhorn, and this Rhyhorn just... What the hell, John? I began my Intimidate switching, but on the first turn it lands a Horn Drill and Oko's Longhorn. I brought in Vermin to start dropping its defense since my Intimidate switching strategy was really screwed up. It proceeds to then land a Crit Takedown, which did 75% of Raticate's health. I started Super Fang to do the damage I could before it KO'd me, and it lands another Horn Drill. Horn Drill, Crit, Horn Drill. I did the math and the chances of that happening were 0.62%. Is that rarer than a shiny? No, but it was still ridiculously unlucky. I brought in Lockdown who couldn't KO it with one hit, but thankfully he didn't heal, so I was able to finish it off. Gyarados I beat thanks to a combination of Lockdown, Bird Brains, and Hydro Pump missing. Once again, I beat his Growlithe using its evolution. Bird Brains then beat Alakazam thanks to taking a Psychic. Finally, it was Venusaur, and for the first time since the very first battle against Pokemon 7, it did not have Sleep Powder. This battle annoyingly took a while still due to synthesis, but chip damage from a Tri-Attack Burn and resisting its Razor Leaves allowed Bird Brains to take the win. After losing two Pokemon to Rhyhorn very close to the beginning of that battle, I thought I was screwed, but my team pulled through and I defeated Pokemon 7 for the second to last time. Next was the victory road, but nothing of particular interest happened here. My team was under leveled, so my max repels didn't work. So that was annoying. And I avoided as many trainers as I could on my first trip, then went back to battle them later. Once I was through though, I grinded up the team quite a lot to level 57, about halfway between the league's lowest and highest level Pokemon. I also changed up their movesets quite a bit. I deleted some unnecessary HMs like Cut or Surf, although I left Fly on Dodrio, and I also taught several of them Hyper Beam since you can buy TMs from the department store. There was one moveset change though that mattered more than any other, Belly Drum. Belly Drum is a normal type move that removes half of the user's maximum HP in exchange for maximizing its attack, taking it to plus six. It's good and competitive, and even better in a playthrough when you can use potions. It's a terrifying move, especially on a bulky Pokemon. And guess who learns it? The very bulky, lock down the Snorlax. After grabbing some tiny mushrooms from Mount Moon, I headed to the move reminder on Two Island and taught Lockdown Belly Drum. Right after that, I also taught it Return, since due to its high friendship, it was 102 base power. I was ready to belly drum sweep the hell out of the league. Well, parts of it. Lorelei was up first, and the belly drum sweeping worked to perfection. All I had to do was belly drum, potion up, then oko anything in my way. Jinx proved more annoying due to causing sleep and infatuation, but eventually Lockdown got the win single-handedly. Next was Bruno though, and this was gonna be tougher. Not only is his entire team rock or fighting type, two of the types that my normal type using normal type team really hates, but also his first Onyx, the Pokemon he leads with, knows Roar, which could force a switch out after I had done the belly drum boosting causing me to lose it. I needed to use other strategies. Bruno led with the Roaring Onyx, and I led with Longhorn to begin my Intimidate switching strategy. Although once Bloodhound came in, I decided it would be better to just lower its defense and began leering instead. After a bit of that, I brought in Vermin to Super Fang and strength its way to victory, and that plan succeeded in just two hits thanks to a crit. In came Hitmonchan, and I didn't feel comfortable setting up against it with Lockdown, so I brought in Bird Brains. Try attack did a lot, but Hitmonchan went for counter, which obliterated Bird Brains. Longhorn was able to come in and finish it off though. Hitmonlee came in, so I brought in Needle. Thanks to its strength doing about half, plus some poison point poison damage, Needle easily won in two turns. Then Bruno sent in his second Onyx, which I was comfortable setting up against with Belly Drum. 
Once the setup was done, Lockdown O-Code it with Return. Finally was his terrifying Machamp. I went for Return, worried that Hyper Beam might miss. Machamp landed a devastating cross chop, but Lockdown clutched it and held on. The Return decimated Machamp, winning the uphill battle against the fighting and rock type specialist. Next was Agatha with three ghost type Pokemon. So belly drum sweeping wasn't gonna work here because every time she sent in a ghost, I had to bring in Bloodhound to sniff it. The battle ended up proving more annoying than difficult. Bloodhound odor sleuthed each ghost when it came in, and then I usually ended up defeating her Pokemon with a variety of my team, due to all the sleep shenanigans she likes to pull and me switching out when that happened. The most notable turn was her Arbok taking down Vermin due to a sludge bomb after a screech. At the end of the battle, half my team was asleep and one was fainted, but I was never in danger of losing. The final Elite Four member was Lance, and this ended up being the easiest battle of the bunch, since Lockdown could easily belly drum sweep freely. His last Dragonair couldn't even KO it with a Hyper Beam, and Lockdown ended the battle with four HP. It was beautiful. Then it was time for the last battle of the game, my final face-off with Pokemon 7. His Pidgeot knew Whirlwind, so I couldn't lead with Lockdown because I didn't want a forced switch to lose my Belly Drum boost. I led with Longhorn instead, who I had to switch out before I could KO the Pidgeot due to Feather Dance dropping my attack. He used that turn to heal, and then Bird Brains came in and promptly froze it with Tri-Attack. Tri-Attack was so fun in this game. The amount of times I froze enemy Pokemon was beautifully large. Another Tri-Attack wouldn't KO, but a Hyper Beam did, proving my bird superior. The switch battle style allowed me to avoid the recharge turn, so I swapped in Lockdown against Rhydon to set up Belly Drum. I got scared though at first and tested a return to see how much Earthquake would do, but he scary faced first. Then I just decided to Belly Drum and Earthquake did about a third, making my HP go down to just 23. I healed up, tanked a takedown, tanked an earthquake, then clicked return. That was unfortunately not enough to KO though, forcing me to heal again. He didn't heal though, so an earthquake and a quick claw move first, body slam later, lockdown took down Rhydon. Alakazam hit decently hard with Psychic, but lockdown survived and O coded. Gyarados dropped his attack to just plus five, but that was still plenty for me. After healing up, I O coded it with return. Arcanine dropped it to plus four, but that still didn't matter, and Lockdown o code it too. Finally was his Venusaur, the Pokemon whose sleep powder caused me so many problems. In an act of sheer victorious defiance, I o code it with Hyper Beam, using the Pokemon known for sleeping a lot. I had beaten Fire Red using only normal type moves, and this beautiful squad was the team I did it with. Just look at them. What an unexpectedly cool team I ended up with. Closing thoughts on this playthrough is that it wasn't actually that bad. Battling rock types and steel types, sure, that was annoying, but it gave me a chance to kind of figure out how to beat them almost like a puzzle. I got to solve a lot of puzzles, like odor sleuthing the ghost types and intimidating and super fanging the rock types and using static and poison point to my advantage. It was fun to figure those things out. Lockdown the Snorlax was absolutely the MVP. I'm so happy I noticed and remembered and can learn Belly Drum because that made decimating the league just really fun. Thanks so much for watching and an extra special thanks to my patrons over on Patreon who are helping support my channel independent of fluctuating YouTube ad rates. If you wanna help support me in the same way, the link is in the description below. Also, if you wanna check out some more of my fun Pokemon content, I recommend these videos here. All right, that's all I have for now. So until next time, big fans. Gotta catch them all.